Hi everyone, myself Dr. Saravana Krishna Raja, cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, here is Dr. Morley, vascular surgeon. We both are going to discuss about INA recall in the, the previous year questions. So uh, if you uh, think about the knee traces and INI, there is a major difference about the questions. For the knee traces, you may need a basic knowledge about the cardiothoracic surgery. For the INI, you need some in-depth knowledge to answer all the questions. That's why for the past two years, we are just observing. The questions are getting tougher and tougher. What morally, sir, what do you feel about the questions? Absolutely, sir. I think uh, it is more uh, subject-based and application-based. And there will be a lot of questions regarding how you are going to apply yourself in the field of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery and uh, how uh, if you are going to uh, whenever you're going they will think as if you're going to work as a first year resident and that's how the questions are based on i think you should be a little more um, studying in depth about the cardiothoracic and vascular surgery to have a good result and the outcome as well yes you are rightly said sir you must have an in-depth knowledge about the subject so first uh, let me uh, discuss about the cardiothoracic surgery sir uh, so, from the questions, we have observed that uh, you need the basic and the in-depth knowledge. So, uh, regarding the basics, you should know that our heart beats about 1 lakh times per day. And if it means that it implies it beats about 2.5 billion times over the entire lifespan of the individual. So, we can move on to the next question that has been asked in the INI. What is the heparin dose that should be given before the start of the cardiopulmonary bypass? Simply, we should not be able to uh, put all the cannulas and start the CTB because the coagulation cascade will get activated. So for that, you need to give heparin and the dose is 300 units per kg, right? 300 units per kg. And coming to the ACT, ACT should be maintained more than 480 seconds. The activated clotting time is uh, one of the bedside investigation to uh, find the heparin efficacy. So it should be more than 480 seconds before the start of the heart lung machine. So we are we will be doing all the surgeries. After the completion of the surgeries, what we have to do, we should reverse the heparin with protamine. And I like you people to know the basic point and the value of the protamine is, you have to give protamine the ratio of 1 is to 1.3, right? 1 is to 1.3 is the ratio what you need to give protamine after completion of the cardiac, cardiac procedures, the open heart procedures, right? Next, regarding the site of cannulation. So what are the um, arterial sites you need to cannulate? The first and foremost being ascending aorta. That too, the distal part of the ascending aorta. See, the distal part of the ascending aorta is the exact site for arterial cannulation. There are other available arteries which we can be Use those arteries for arterial cannulation. Those are axillary artery and femoral artery. The point is ascending aorta and axillary artery. Through these approaches, the circulation will be anti-grade. Through the femoral artery, the circulation will be retrograde. So again, MCQ has been asked and this year. So anti-grade uh, uh, aortic cannulation are through ascending aorta and axillary artery. A retrograde perfusion through femoral artery. And you can see what is the site of cardioplegia. So it is the exact site of cardioplegia. That is, this is aortic root. Just distal to the aortic root, it is a part of ascending aorta. We, we should uh, take a first string for a cardioplegia cannula. What is cardioplegia? It is the solution rich in uh, potassium to arrest the heart in diastole. Right? Okay. So we have uh, cannulated the ascending aorta. Here is the first string for cardioplegia. We need to put the cross clamp here for all the open heart procedures. For aortic procedures, see here, we need to open the aortic root so that we can directly see the ostium and we can give cardioplegia through the coronary ostium. That is the left and right coronary ostium. So these are all the basic points which you should know before answering any basic points about the arterial cannulation. Then coming to the history. Every year a question has been asked from the history. So it is the must to read all the points about history 
because in ss uh, it is very rare to see uh, questions in the history but in ini you should okay so who is john gibbon he is the one who discovered the heart lung machine and did the first to open heart surgery in the year 1953 okay next dr gross dr gross is the pioneer in congenital cardiac surgeries he did the first cardiac surgery in pediatric individuals the two the pda ligation in the year 1938 denton cooley is one of the very famous surgeon in cardiothoracic surgery he discovered the artificial heart he is a student of dr debake okay next henry sutter so it is a very very primitive uh, surgical method for the close metal commissurotomy in the year 1925 henry sutter did the cmc that is close metal commissurotomy nowadays it has been replaced by PTMC, okay, percutaneous transmetal commissurotomy. Next, coming to the aortic valve implantation, Hofnagel implanted the aortic valve in descending thoracic aorta, whereas Horton implanted the aortic valve at the in situ aortic annulus. Next, coming to the uh, mitral valve replacement, Star Edwards. Star Edwards replaced the mitral valve. You have to see that both aortic and mitral valve replacement were done. The history. in the year 1960 coming to the history of cabg so sabiston in the year 1962 he is the one who used the saphenous vein the reverse saphenous vein for cabg then dr green 1968 he only used internal mammary artery as a bypass conduit for cabg then coming to the history of transplantation uh, christian bernard so it was the question that has been asked in the previous year christian bernard He did the first cardiac transplantation in the year 1967, and in one examination, the date and the month has been asked. So kindly, you have to concentrate. That is third December 1967. In coming to the lung transplantation, Dr. James Hardy performed the first lung transplantation in the year 1963. Then first heart and lung transplantation by Dr. Bruce Reeds, Norman Shumway. So both did the first heart and lung transplantation in the year 1981. then evolution of cabg and the coronary interventions this has been given beautifully in the recent edition bailey and low so kindly go through you guys so all the points just keep in mind this the year always keep in mind definitely you can easily answer any questions from the history of cardiac surgery next coming to the conduction system a question has been asked about the location of sc node uh, so next year av node location may be asked So, what is the exact location of SCA node? SCA node is located at the junction between the SVC and right atrium. In particular, for preparing the INA level, no. So, you should know SCA node is exactly at the anterolateral. See here, anterolateral aspect of the junction between the SVC and the right atrium. Clear? Next, what is the AV node? It is the next uh, conduction uh, tissue. all the tracts from the sa node join goes to the av node so where is the av node it is located in the right atrium okay right atrium and that too the anatomy is very important you should know about the triangle of cock the boundaries of triangle of cock and that too at the triangle of cock where is the av node that is the point you people need to listen i will show you with a diagram and uh, from the av node there is a bundle of keys and from the bundle of keys there there will be two bundles that is left and right bundle that ends up with patchy fibers so it is the triangle of cock so it is a triangle of cock you can see the beautiful tricuspid valve city here it is a septal leaflet of tricuspid valve you can also see the coronary sinus here and this is the tendon of todoro so the tendon of todoro the septal leaflet the coronary sinus forms the boundary of the triangle of cock can you tell which where is the location of av node the av node is located at the apex of the triangle of cock that is a simple so whenever you think of av node you should know the triangle of cock and its boundaries and the location the location is at the apex of the triangle of cock next we can move on to the acute coronary syndrome a question has been asked from this uh, acute coronary syndrome so what are all the components st elevation mi non st elevation mi and unstable angina and unstable angina right so uh, how can we diagnose uh, 
ஆனாஸ்ட்ரோபோனின்ஸ் <laughs> so you have to do both this uh, available cardiac biomarkers then you should diagnose if it is if it was elevated then it is enstemy biomarkers are normal it is unstable angina so likewise uh, you need to uh, differentiate the acute coronary syndrome then you have to know the very very basics of the ecg right it is a normal ecg i hope everyone know what is pq or and s in ischemia there will be st depression right st depression in injury there will be st elevation so it is uh, the very very basic points about uh, ischemic events in ecg the last year question has been asked the st elevation indicates infarction or ischemia the answer is infarction right st elevation it is uh, infarction then in what are the cardiac biomarkers to be raised after mi there are myoglobin ckmb and troponins which is the first cardiac biomarker to be raised after mi that is uh, ckmb and myoglobins and uh, troponins so among these which is very very specific troponins are very specific and you have to know the troponins will be keep on raised in the serum even for up to 10 to 12 days whereas uh, ckmb will be coming down within 2 to 3 days and what is the importance of ckmb ckmb is very useful to detect a reinfarction or a new infarction after ev clear next uh, regarding the types of cabg and you know uh, these are all the types of cab on cab what is off cab that is off pump cabg that is also called as beating of cabg that is on pump then um, mid cab minimal invasive cabg hybrid mid cab and robotic cabg a question has been asked so what is uh, hybrid mid cap so you should know it involves cabg and pca what is pca it is nothing but angioplasty so uh, best vessel that can be given to the left handed descending artery is internal mammary artery so for a hybrid uh, cabg we used to do lima to led then later period the cardiologist used to do uh, stenting to the non dominant vessel like rca or pda so is so, uh, involving uh, surgical point and uh, the interventional method both that is hybrid method that is called as uh, hybrid mid cap then uh, question has been asked what is the use of an octopus in cabg so this is the octopus so octopus is used as a myocardial stabilizer for beating out cabg that is also called as off pump cabg so this is the importance of octopus you should also know the picture how it appears so that it will be easier for you to understand and the answer if uh, simply the diagram has been asked in your exam so the octopus is a myocardial stabilizer so what is this machine this is a typical ecmo machine this is a typical ecmo machine ecmo is uh, nothing but the miniature of the uh, conventional heart lung machine a question has been asked in the recent year about the pump that was used in ecmo what is this pump this pump is centrifugal pump kindly make a note of it it is centrifugal pump in conventional cpb we are using the roller pump in ecmo we are using the centrifugal pump so what is the main role of ecmo nowadays ecmo are very very useful as a bridge to transplantation device suppose a patient with a failing heart is waiting for a uh the heart transplantation the waiting period may be it may we may not know okay the waiting period may be a uh, more than a month so in those time how can we manage the failing heart we can uh, uh, proceed with uh, inotropes and it's not able to manage means we need to put the patient on ecmo so nowadays ecmo is very useful as a bridge to transplantation device then coming to the cardiac valves uh so can you able to see these three valves or the mechanical valves mechanical prosthetic valves 
and among these the commonest uh, valve being the bileaflet valve this is tilting disc valve this is the age old ball and cage valve right ball and cage valve star edwards valve uh, so this uh, has been uh, discontinued because of uh, high hemolysis these are all the two valves currently in use these two are uh, very uh, low profile valves and uh, less uh, thrombogenicity and the commercially available bileaflet valve are senju and uh, meril valves bretonia and the commercial available tilting disc valves being ttk chitta valve and these are all the bioprosthetic valve bioprosthetic valve can be made from a bovine pericardium or the native porcine aortic valve these are all the two valves in questions if a question asked from about the bioprosthetic valve which bioprosthetic valve is better you need to answer the bovine pericardial valve is better than the porcine native tissue valve okay right so what is this uh, this is the graph to be used for ross procedure so what is the ross procedure uh, in individuals who uh, need not to take anticoagulants in the post operative period and in younger individuals where the child will be growing now so uh, what the graft what we are what we are putting that should also needs to grow so in children with aortic stenosis we need to do a ross procedure it is nothing but the patient's own pulmonary valve with the root will be taken and put in the aortic root level the patient's deceased aortic root will be removed and the patient's own pulmonary root will be taken and stitched with the aortic root level and what will be uh, what will we do about the uh, excess pulmonary root we should use a cryo preserved cadaveric pulmonary graft to the excess pulmonary uh, root so this procedure is called as ross procedure very very useful in uh, children with aortic stenosis that is the point like to convey okay so what are they can you see so these two types of valve are uh, typically designed for tavi so what is tavi tavi is a uh, recently uh, evolving um, non surgical intervention for aortic stenosis that is trans aortic valve implantation so without surgery by sardinger method we can deploy uh, this self expandable aortic valve at the native uh, aortic valve portion which is called as tavi right next uh, question has been asked from the classification of mitral regurgitation the carpentier's classification of mitral regurgitation the carpentier classified uh, mitral regurgitation into three types they are type 1 type 2 type 3a and type 3b type 1 is so you need to know the examples each examples for each and every types i will be having another slide for your easy understanding so the type 1 dysfunction the positive factors are endocarditis the most commonly then the dcm then coming to the type 2 you can see the borlos disease borlos is nothing but the extreme form of fdd right that is degenerative disease extreme disease that will cause regurgitation and you should note the borlos disease uh, classified under type 2 this year this question has been asked so i like you guys to kindly concentrate about the borlos disease and the classification type and likewise i like you people to concentrate on this rheumatic heart disease the rheumatic heart disease has been classified rheumatic mr has been classified under type 3a in carpentier's classification so likewise before examination kindly go through this table so it is very very commonest table where questions plenty of questions have been uh, asked in the previous years then coming to the duke's criteria and in uh, neat ss there won't be any questions about uh, duke's criteria or jones criteria but in ini the question has been asked uh, so these points are not given in uh, sabistron or bailey so i have to uh, take it down the duke's criteria the major criteria uh, of duke's criteria is blood culture positive organisms and there will be clear cut evidence of echocardiographic involvement so this comes from the major criteria and this are all the minor criteria and among the minor criteria you should uh, know all these uh, named the nodes right oslers nodes and janway lesions and roth spots okay oslers nodes are nothing but the painful nodes at the uh, pulp of the 
fingers painful it will be painful osseous whereas john wayne's janway lesions are painless lesions on the palms and soles painless lesions and rod spots you can see in the retina so these are all the points you need to understand and this should be the diagnostic criteria then we can move on to the jones criteria for rheumatic fever there will be always a confusion with uh, jones and jones so you guys always very clear jones for rheumatic fever so what are the five major criteria for rheumatic fever it is pan cordiitis polyarthritis serenam scoria subcutaneous nodules and erythema marginatum the confusion will be uh, there about the what erythema like that right you should know it is erythema marginatum it is very very pathognomonic of the rheumatic fever okay next we can move on to the congenital heart diseases so uh, it should be uh, discussed in the future slides so at this level you can you, you should know all the t's that is truncus arteriosus transmission of great vessels trichotillomania atresia tetralogia of tallow and tapvc so all these uh, five t's from the synotic heart disease and uh, coming to the asynotic heart diseases asd vsd pda and coagulation the question has been asked which is the most common synotic heart disease the answer is tetralogy of fallow and coming to the asynotic level which is the most commonest one it is the vsd next uh, about the triangle of safety is yes. coming to the triangle of safety what are the boundaries of triangle of safety why it is important the boundaries are pectoral is major latissimus dorsi and the fifth rib so all these uh, three forms the boundaries of triangle of safety because it is the safest triangle to insert the icd without injuring any underlying structures okay the question has been asked about the triangle of safety in the previous slide then coming to the chest wall deformities uh, you should know what is excavatum it is nothing but the funnel shaped depressed chest wall is excavatum uh, uh, i mean next one is pgn chest is peronatum so uh, um, this previous year no uh, this diagram has been uh, displayed and you should you should answer so kindly i have a look at it and the next is polan syndrome the polan syndrome the main point is it is a non familial syndrome it is non familial so make a note it is not never uh, familial and you can see uh, here there is a pectoralis muscle atrophy along with the pectoralis minor both muscles will be uh, atrophied in polan syndrome and there will be a uh, many uh, limb deformities in polan syndrome so these are all the salient features in polan syndrome and uh, you should know what is the flywheel chest and what is the importance and how will you manage right a question has been asked about osteosynthesis role in flywheel chest so what is a flywheel chest the fracture of more than 3 ribs with having two fractures on the same side the exact definition of a flywheel chest so how can we manage can can be managed by very good analgesics and even uh, because of lung contusion the patient may need a ventilatory support and for a surgical treatment these individuals will be benefited by osteosynthesis is nothing but using a processes to fix all the fractured ribs next coming to emergency thoracotomy a question has been asked in the casualty a patient stab injury came with uh, hypotension with the bex triad uh, all the things all the events with the tamponade so how can how will you manage whether you will go with the midline sternotomy or a left anterior thoracotomy the answer is left anterior thoracotomy it's because it is the beautiful incision where definitely with as early as possible we can enter the thoracic cavity we cut open the pericardium and we can identify the rent in the heart and we can suture okay so the answer is left anterolateral thoracotomy in emergency conditions next uh, we need to see few points about the mediastinum last year a question has been asked which is the most commonest posterior mediastinal tumor or posterior mediastinal mass so before that we should know what are all the structures in the corresponding mediastinum then it will be easier for you to have a, an idea about the most common uh, pathological conditions in the anterior mediastinum the most common structures being thymus all the lymph nodes ectopic thyroid right these are all the structures comprising the anterior mediastinum and in the middle mediastinum all the vascular structures the heart great vessels trachea will be in the anterior middle mediastinum 
and the posterior mediastinum or the sympathetic uh, chain will be in the posterior mediastinum. So the most commonest pathological tumors in the corresponding mediastinum are in the anterior mediastinum, it is a thymoma, middle mediastinum, pleuropericoidal cyst, and posterior mediastinum, all the neurogenic tumors are common in the posterior mediastinum. Okay. Then coming to the TNM8 classification. So I know uh, everyone will be familiar with the TNM7 classification of lung malignancies, but in the recent years, a uh, more precise question has been asked from the modifications in the TNM8 edition of uh, uh, lung malignancy. So last year, a question has been asked, involvement of diaphragm constitute what T-staging, right? So in the TNM7, it has been classified under T3, but TNM8, TNM, uh, diaphragm involvement in T4. So these are all the subtle changes which you should be familiar what has been happened. So in this table, you can see all the sentences given in the red or the modifications from the TNM7. So kindly go through this chart uh, before your examination. Next to the dysphagia lusoria. So what is the culprit vessel causing the dysphagia lusoria? And that word which is called as the lusorian artery. It is nothing but the right subclavian artery, aberrant right subclavian artery. This aberrant artery arises from the distal, just distal to the subclavian, uh, left subclavian artery from the descending thoracic aorta. So this abnormal, anomalous right subclavian artery called as lusorian artery will course behind the esophagus. So that's what the patient typically used to have dysphagia that is called as dysphagia lusoria. Again, coming to the lung abscess, why lung abscess are more common the right lower lobe? So this is a point because the right main bronchus is shorter, wider and somewhat vertical. So the aspiration is more common on the right lower lobe. And in particular, if the question asked from which segment of the lower lobe, then you should be ready to answer it is nothing but the superior segment of the lower lobe. And if it is in the upper lobe, you should answer the segment is posterior segment. And these are all the two fissures on both sides. On the right side, since there are three lobes, there are two fissures, horizontal and vertical oblique fissure. The oblique fissure is a major fissure. This separates the lower lobe from the middle lobe and upper lobe. And this one is a minor fissure. This separates upper lobe from the middle lobe. And then on the left side, there is a single fissure called the oblique fissure. And you should know the question has been asked. The lingula corresponds to which lobe of the lung? You can see the lingula corresponds to left upper lobe. Right? That is the answer. Then coming to the fetal circulation. A question has been sorry. A question has been asked. What are all the structural shunts in the fetal life? So for that, we should know the three structural shunts in the fetal life. They are the ductus venosus, ductus arteriosus, and foramen ovale. So in the fetal life, the liver and the lungs will, are not functional. So the oxygenated blood from placenta the help of umbilical vein bypasses the liver the help of ductus venosus and here since the lungs are non-functional the blood from the pulmonary artery it won't go to the lungs it enters the descending thoracic artery with the help of ductus arteriosus so the three structural functions are ductus venosus ductus arteriosus and the foramen ovale which is at the interatrial level clear Again, we are going to see uh, in detail about the synodic heart diseases. As we all uh, have been uh, discussed about the commonest synodic heart disease, the being tetralogy of fallow. Now, you should also know other defects that cause cyanosis. Uh, they are hypoplastic left heart syndrome, a pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum, double outlet right ventricle, and double inlet left ventricle. This is popularly called as DORV and is called as. Uh, DILV. Right? So, these are all the uh, commonest synodic heart diseases. And uh, a question has been asked what is that? In hypoplastic left heart syndrome, a child can be made survive by giving what? By giving oxygen, the prostaglandin, like that. So, you have to know that 
in this congenital heart uh, syndrome the importance of pda you should know so we have to give prostaglandins to maintain the patency of uh, pda then only the survival can be made possible okay then coming to the asynotic heart diseases uh, next question has been asked is the most common asynotic heart diseases the answer is uh, vsd and i want to uh, pinpoint few most commonest types most commonest vsd is uh, perimembranous vsd and the most commonest asd is ostium secundum asd right and coming to the coagulation of aorta the infantile coagulation is pre ductal and other type is post ductal so uh, so while reading we should also uh, revise uh, about the types and all and the question has been asked about the alcapa so what is alcapa it is nothing but the anomalous coronary artery from the pulmonary artery so in this situation the affected child will develop gradual lv dysfunction lv dysfunction and the child will develop gradual mitral regurgitation because of ischemia that is called as ischemic mitral regurgitation so while identifying by doing echocardiography the child being going for pulmonary edema we should do angiogram and we should identify the alcapa as early as possible because it is surgically correctable and the child can lead a normal life so how can we uh, correct the alcapa it is nothing but we, uh, we have to reimplant the coronary we have to reimplant the coronary from the pulmonary artery into the aorta aortic root so this is the simplest method of alcapa but the question asked is recurrent procedure so what is recurrent procedure it to be done for alcapa it is nothing but in spite of reimplantation there will be a tubed conduit tube graft connecting the aorta through the pulmonary artery into the ostium so this procedure is called as recurrent procedure it has to be done for alcapa clear next you should know the characteristic x ray appearances in few congenital heart diseases this time a box shaped heart has been asked so it is seen in epstein anomaly and along with that you should also uh, learn about a boot shaped heart in tetralogy of fallow snowman or figure of eight in supracardiac tapvc remember egon in appearance in tgv what is tgv transposition of great vessels and these are all the associated heart defects in the corresponding syndromes is very very important and uh, this year a schmitter syndrome has been asked what is schmitter syndrome it is nothing but the anomalous pulmonary vein draining into the ivc because this anomalous pulmonary vein will be looking like the schmitter is also called as turkish sword so that's what it is called as schmitter syndrome or schmitter sign you should also know the down syndrome the most commonest defect associated down syndrome is being ostium primum asd and uh, regarding the turner syndrome the coagulation of aorta generally coagulation is common in males if it is seen in females the child will be having a turner syndrome so this is a clear cut statement given in your statistician so always whenever you think of uh, the option given you have to choose coagulation of aorta and turner syndrome then halteron syndrome asd and along with uh, limb anomalies then noonan syndrome asd with pulmonary valve stenosis the lutum badges asd with rheumatic ms rheumatic ms is very important sometimes options may be given as asd with uh, mr it is strong the lutum badges the answer is asd with rheumatic ms so thank you thank you friends so these are all the questions that has been asked in the examination we have recalled and kindly go through all the questions in the doc tutorial app we have uh, clearly explained the entire cardiothoracic surgery myself and dr murli so kindly go through it and uh, all the very best guys so kindly ping me if you have taken ini over to dr murli um thanks a lot sir i think you have covered it extensively and uh, we have seen all the aspects of it we have uh, sir has covered initially all the basics then valvular heart disease then thoracic cabbage as well as thoracic heart disease congenital and uh, i think you have just left the vascular part for me to do and uh, we are just going through the what are the vascular things which we need to do as so i'll just share the screen and start the presentation we will see where we should concentrate and what all things can be asked so in iniss so the thing is whenever you have questions 
it is always based on aortic and major aortic pathologies the cardiothoracic part is a major part vascular part is up on the minor end uh, if you get a seat in chitrathirunal which is not opening up in this area side but eventually in november or december entry you may get, you may get more vascular questions it just jump into the nis questions review so aortic dissection is one of the important point if you see the standard classification of aortic dissection is very important stand for type a a stands for type a stands for the tear is neither in the ascending aorta or the involvement of arch of aorta so stand for type a involvement of ascending or arch of aorta and type b is when there is ascending an arch is not involved and the tear is there in the entry tear is there in the descending aorta and it can be extend all the way from the top and the false lumen can go brick and it can compromise the mesenteric vasculature and renal vasculature so if it stops at around the diaphragmatic level we call it as debecky type 3a and if it involves the whole length of the aortic uh, abdomen thoracic and abdominal aorta we call it as debecky type 3b so you should remember that the aortic dissection can be either hyperacute acute or subacute and chronic if it is less than 24 hours it is hyperacute if it is presenting within 2 to 7 days it is acute and subacute if it is more than 7 days and less than a month and more than a month is chronic so aortic dissection intramural hematoma and penetrating aortic ulcer are representative of the same disease this is a spectrum of the disease which we what we call it as acute aortic syndrome we call it as acute aortic syndrome if the syndrome involves only the intima and media patient will end up with penetrating aortic ulcer if it involves only the media locally then it will be intramural hematoma if the media is extending beyond a level then we call it as aortic dissection and the treatment is more or less the same for all the three aortic dissection intramural hematoma and penetrating aortic ulcer depending upon where the involvement is and it is the, based on the classification only we will be able to treat these patients so we should know what is stand for type a classification what is stand for type b classification and and that if the aortic syndrome involves all the three layers of vessel wall then the patient will end up with aortic aneurysm so the management is if the ascending aorta is involved that is type a of stanford or type 1 and 2 of debecky then the patient needs an immediate surgical management so the, what happens is the patient will have start to have compromise of coronary ostea or patient will have compromise of the arch vessels the innominate arteries or the carotids and patient can end up having a myocardial infarction stroke along with the aortic dissection and the mortality increases by around 1 to 2 percentage for every one hour immediate after the origin of dissection in whereas in case of type b aortic dissection the dissection there there will be a tear and the blood vessel will go into the false lumen the false lumen can extend to the top or it can extend all the way down but the problem is if it is not progressing we should remember generally the type b aortic dissections are managed conservatively only in there is complication like if the patient does not develop paraplegia if the patient develops a vascular ischemia of kidneys or mesenteric blood vessel or the lower limb vessel we need to intervene or if there is a problem of thread and rupture we'll just go through them type a aortic dissections are surgical emergency usually the open surgical repair medical management that is impulse control therapy or anti impulse therapy is the word which they will be looking for you should is a temporizing measure and it is for palliating the unfit patient and risk of mortality is rising by 1 to 2 percent for every hour in the past 24 hours and anti impulse therapy will reduce the 24 hour mortality rate so type b aortic dissection revolves around the anti impulse therapy mainly what they does is we use a selective beta blockade as a preferred first line management it does lower the blood pressure it decreases the reduce aortic tension from pressure impulse decrease in heart rate decrease in blood pressure and we improve the end organ perfusion that is the idea so type b aortic dissection has emerged as a treatment of choice in uncomplicated dissection complication like rupture or malperfusion and sometimes with non complicated dissection 
so when the patient is having progression of aortic syndrome we can all as to thoracic aorta thoracic aorta double aneurysm or anything then we can do tvar for them as well so the goal in doing a tvar is to cover the primary intimal tear very very important what is the goal in doing a tvar is to cover the primary intimal tear we are we can also do obliteration of the false lumen and increase the true lumen diameter and the main thing is once the primary tear is covered the false lumen will start to thrombose and eventually the organ perfusion will improve that is the main idea and remember type b aortic dissection is medically managed unless there is a rupture or malperfusion and usually it is anti impulse therapy very very important you should remember they will ask you questions in this if they are going to ask you about type b aortic dissection management you should know what drug will be given what is the goals and how it is done then acute limb ischemia one of the important thing which even in our recent bailey and love they have understood the importance and they have added this to our topic they have added this classification mainly so this is nothing new we have whoever has been preparing for ini and people who have worked in cardiothoracic vascular unit they will know about the classification of acute limb ischemia class 1 is a viable limb ischemia class 2 is a threatened limb ischemia and class 3 is an irreversible limb ischemia in class 1 patient will have the first symptom will be pain and the first sign will be absence of pulses so patient will have first symptom will be pain and this first sign will be absence of pulses and the way the point which will say the patient is going to threaten limb ischemia is the nerves are dying the reason the nerves symptoms that is there is paralysis or paresthesia sensory motor weakness is happening is because the nerves are very sensitive to ischemia and immediately on ischemic events the nerves started becoming weaker so that is how the patient says that he is having paralysis or paresthesia once you improve the perfusion the nerves will regenerate uh, regain their what the original potential but it should be done as early as possible that's why class 2 ischemia is threatened limb ischemia need to be salvaged immediately in class 3 it is irreversible where the patient has started developing major patches the blob mottling of tissues has happened so that is irreversible limb ischemia so that may end up with amputation so class 1 class 2a we can do imaging and revascularization with thrombolysis or thromboembolectomy in class 2b that is imminently threatened limb ischemia patient should go to operating room immediately on stable imaging and thromboembolectomy or bypass or endovascular management and class 3 is amputation very very important just remember they are not going to ask you which is class 2a or class 2b they will give you a case scenario and the case scenario will have features like rheumatic heart disease or ischemic heart disease or patient has an aneurysm which is thrown in embolism we should know what are the sources of this embolism because acute limb ischemia usually occurs after a rheumatic with the background of rheumatic heart disease or patient with ischemic heart disease and atrial fibrillation or a patient who has an having an aneurysm which is showing a tower of thrombus downstream so if these are the things are there then you should look whether the patient is having neurological symptoms if the neurological symptoms are there then it is a threatened limb ischemia and management should be chosen accordingly the next is the aneurysm the aneurysm is one of the important thing in the uh, part of uh, aortic aortic syndrome the aneurysm the reason why we are afraid is the risk of rupture the how it is very important how you how you calculate the risk of rupture it is based on laplace law the diameter is directly related to the size of the aneurysm the bigger the aneurysm the risk of rupture is higher and usually we if it is a small aneurysm we do surveillance if the aneurysm to call it as an aneurysm the diameter of the vessel should be 50% over and above the normal diameter so say for example the vessel diameter normally is around 2 cm to call it as an aneurysm it should be more than 3 cm and how will you do surveillance so if the patient is having a 3.5 cm aneurysm we will keep them on surveillance with ultrasound and ct sos and if the aneurysm size is increasing more than 0.5 cm per year then it is an indication for early repair so it is we are doing a prophylactic repair in that case unless rupture or symptomatic if you are doing a repair that is called as prophylactic repair usually it does not grow very fast and it is a very slow growing aneurysm and risk of aneurysm rupture will exceed all cause death then you need to intervene so that is why we got this sizes so we call triple a wise small triple a is 4 to 5 cm and the risk of as annual risk of rupture is 1 percentage 
and annual five year risk of rupture is 5 to 10 percentage and the same way moderate triple a 2 to 5 and 30 to 40 so we if the five year risk rupture rate is higher then we suggest annual so that's why male patients go for a triple a repair at 5.5 centimeters and female go for repair at 5 centimeters very important to remember the numbers they will invariably ask you if they are going to ask you for aneurysms in the same way if the aneurysm is there for ascending aorta then the 55 millimeter 5.5 centimeters cut cut off including patient with bicuspidiotic valve and patient with morphin syndrome or patient with bicus bicuspidiotic valve and risk factor for dissection like hypertension and control then they have lesser threshold of 5 centimeters and selected patients who have had previous history or family history of Marfan dying at a high, low, lesser diameter rupture, relative dying at lesser diameter rupture, then they decrease their T to even 4.5 centimeters. For descending at a 5.5 centimeter, if TVAR is possible, if it has to be open repair, 6 centimeter is a cutoff. For abdominal aortic aneurysm, 5.5 centimeter, all patients. And 5 centimeter, we usually keep it for females. So, when that they will give you risk factors to say that whether this patient is going to have imminent risk, whether the patient is going to have rupture. The, the history will say 80-year-old gentleman who has been chronically smoking, has high mean blood pressure, previous cardiac transplantation. That means patient has a high risk of rupture. There is going to be aortic rupture is a probable diagnosis. So we should know what are the risk factors for triple A development, tobacco use, cholesterol increase, hypertension and male gender. Whereas female gender is a risk factor of aortic rupture and transplantation, immunosuppression, and patient having higher diameter are all risk factors for triple A rupture. So, how do we treat these patients? So, outcomes of surgical intervention are depend on where the location. So, we just saw that triple A uh, neurisms in uh, abdominal aorta have a different threshold, uh, neurisms at thoracic aorta have a different threshold. And same way, if thoracic aneurysm is being operated by TVAR, we keep it as 5.5 centimeters. If it is open, triple, open repair for thoracic aneurysms, it is 6 centimeters. Aortic root are usually treated electively with the mortality rate is expected around 5 percentage. Descending thoracic aortas are usually repaired by TVAR is the most standard of care for aneurysm disease. Thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm, TAAA, thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm, as open repair is much preferred because we are able to do visceral reimplantation, prevent paraplegia by reimplanting the dorsospinal, major dorsospinal arteries which carry artery of Adam Quix and also the visceral arteries like renal SMA and celiac axis. Endovascular, it's growing up. We have a lot of different devices like penetrated devices, physician modified devices chimney snorkel devices but they are still in the early stages open repair is much better preferred for thoracobdominal aortic aneurysm abdominal aortic aneurysm so remember this trial if they are going to ask you regarding surveillance a dream trial is something which you should remember so this is a trial which was conducted in the united kingdom and uh, it was also conducted with dutch there are two uh, trials simultaneously landing in United Kingdom and Dutch. Dutch trial is called as a dream trial where they were surveilling, uh, doing surveillance for aneurysms where they found that early advantage of EVR. So aneurysms uh, treated with endovascular strand grafts have disappeared by the end of two years. So open surgery is a better choice if the patient is not fit for surgery, endovascular aneurysm repair can be done. So what medical management do, they, do we give them? So we give them uh, lifestyle modification and medical management is for people who do not meet surgical criteria or who are not fit for the surgery. And uh, current smoking will cause increase in aneurysm by around 4.4 centimeter millimeter per year. So we said point if it is more than 0.5 millimeter per year, we will intervene. And uh, moderate level of exercise have beneficial effects. Blood pressure management, as we said before, TP by DT should shun down. Anti impulse therapy and beta blockers selective or preferred non-select uh, patient in the same way to prevent aneurysm or dilatation or re regression in morphins especially angiotensin receptor blockers and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are all used and statins have important rates in decreasing the rate of enlargement antiplatelet therapy also helps to as a secondary preventive measure 
so when do we do evr evr is usually for a very very strict anatomy so anatomy is to be sufficient we should have adequate neck sufficient length no angulation the diameter of the proximal end of the aneurysm should be adequate and access vessel should have sufficient diameter but we have getting newer devices where we are able to navigate through smaller vessels and get to place tens in difficult also as we said before we get having custom made fenestrated grafts suprarenal fixation and we have branching device also so these makes life very difficult with endovascular but the problem being the devices wore, wore, uh, worn out and uh, by the end of 2 years and patient starting to have some complication that's why the dream trial takes importance that's why we say that if the patient is fit and healthy open surgery is better post op surveillance is by ct scans and color duplex ultrasound where we measure aortic sac diameter volume graft migration and leaks so this is done at 1 6 and 12 months and yearly thereafter you should remember this this is very important so uh, this is a pictorial representation everyone should have gone through so this is a triple a this is a renal artery and the iliac artery if there is a leak after the placement of the stent graft for the endovascular aneurysm repair it is called as endo leak if it is this is of five types if it is leaking from the proximal or the distal ceiling zone it is 1a or 1b respectively if it is leaking from the back bleeding from the branches that is the inferior mesenteric artery or the lumbar arteries it is type 2 endo leak if it is between the two components you see this is one component this is another iliac limb component if it is separate between these two components it is called as type 3 endo leak and type 4 is because of the porosity of the graft and type 5 is when you have expanding aneurysm without any demonstrable flow we do not have explanation to it if it is type 1a or 1b endo leak it will be identified on table during the procedure itself and it should be treated immediately please make a note type 1a 1b endo leak should be identified on table treated immediately type 2 on follow up it can be observed if it is worsening then you can do laparoscopic clipping or excision of the sac type 3 is also identified on table and it has to be addressed immediately type 4 is fabric porosity this is usually seen in the older generation gap not seeing in our days but still if it is still present in the older generation gap then it is very important to realign the graft with fresh device so the type 4 will be usually identified in the follow up and it needs realignment type 5 you do not have any explanation to the increasing sac size that is when you convert the stent graft endovascular repair to the open repair so moving on we'll go on to the occlusive disease aortoiliac occlusion is usually presents with bilateral claudication in buttocks thigh and calves patient will have absence of femoral pulses and distal pulses and drooy over the aortic region and patient will have impotence vasculogenic impotence this is also called as lerich syndrome it's a triad a important they will they are very fond of asking this question many times it has been asked lerich syndrome will have claudication in buttock thigh and calf absent femoral pulses and below and impotence vasculogenic impotence please make a note it can be vasculogenic impotence vasculogenic erectile dysfunction but you should not say sterility okay no sterility only impotence and second thing is iliac occlusion if it is there patient will have claudication of the one side of the thigh and calf alone and uh, bruy over the iliac region and patient having uh, femoral mobility occlusion will have claudication in the calf and distal obstruction patient will have ankle pulses will be absent so the next thing is patient having um, how will we how do they get their blood supply so there are two types one is the visceral circulation then is the systemic circulation in visceral circulation from sma there is the meandering mesenteric artery also called as arc of riolan which comprises the inferior inferior mesenteric artery and through the superior inferior hemorrhoidal artery reaches the internal iliac and lower limb and the same way winslow's pathway is all the way from the lima rima the internal mammary artery which ends up as musculophrenic and superior epigastric the superior epigastric will anastomose the inferior epigastric in the rectus sheath and that will communicate with the lower limb this is called as winslow's pathway and lumbar arteries will communicate through the deep circumflex and the retroperitoneal branches of the internal iliac and profunda femoris branch so these are the two collateral pathway through which they will ask 
very very important please remember about wins plus pathway please remember about mesenteric circulation also you have you should know about arc of buller uh, pancreatic duodenal arc which will form collateral between celiac axis and sme and uh, we saw the arc of riolan and meandering marginal artery of drummond which will form the collateral between sma and ima and ima and internal iliac arteries are connected with the intern superior and uh, inferior rectal arteries so how recently they have the last time they have also asked about aorta bifemoral bypass how it is done you should know that the aorta is exposed usually through the midline and the aorta before it is being clapped as sir has already pointed out we will heparinize these patients and act will be monitored and after clamping we either do an end to end anastomosis or end to side anastomosis we will see where is end to end and where is end to side done and after the is is done we will tunnel the graft retroperitoneally you can see the ureters coming down the graft should be tunneled retroperitoneally posterior to the ureter if it is getting tunneled anterior to the ureter it will cause compression and cause hydroeurotronephrosis very very important so retroperitoneal tunneling end to end anastomosis and in aneurysm and juxtal occlusion end to side anastomosis has a risk of embolization and aortic fistulas but when there is a large apparent renal artery inferior mesenteric artery or pelvic circulation if it is patent then to prevent impotence colonic ischemia we do end to side anastomosis so last one last couple of topics carotid body tumor is very very important and last time they asked you regarding where it is originating from and whether it is malignant so carotid body tumor just to briefly go through it's a synonymously it's also called as chemodectoma the third branchial large and it is present in the adventitia and periadventitia cc of c common carotid artery supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve external carotid artery and vertebral artery and presents as along with paraganglio and glomus tumor only 5% is malignant and especially when it is metastasizing to the distant sites it is usually locally invasive tumor and hence it should if it is invading the carotid artery or like nearing glossopharyngeal nerve it is not considered as malignant and 35% will have hereditary positive history also usually presents as fifth or seventh decade as asymptomatic mass shambling classification is what is used to treat the tumors less than 5 cm free of vessel is type 1 intimately involving vessel but not fully encasing is type 2 and encasing the vessel is type 3 so encasing fully encasing is type 3 and partially is type 2 and less than 5 cm tumor is type 1 and treatment is by surgery radi it's not key there is no chemo radiation is used only surgery and only surgery is a treatment of choice and finally just a briefly to go about so you should also know about axial bifem if the patient is not fit for aorta bifem or bypass if there is a going to be an occlusion patient who are unfit we do what is called as axial bifem or bypass we take inflow from the axillary artery and tunnel it subcutaneously and bring it down to the femoral artery and anastomose to both femoral artery this is done for patient with multiple comorbidities not fit for major anesthesia and uh, the five year patency is around 30 to 80 percentage and many there many a time the patient pass uh, pass away and leave us because mortality is because of the comorbid medical illness rather than the graft or lower limb ischemia as such <coughs> remember about thoracic outlet syndrome may the very 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 important because it is something which is like, like a gray area sometimes they ask you about ruse procedure and all these things so important to know about where it is you should know about scalene triangle costoclavicular triangle and quadrangular space scalene triangle is scalene as anterior medius and the first rib where there is a risk of arterial and neurological tears where the arteries and the brachial plexus come out and uh, costoclavicular triangle is between the uh, beneath the clavicle and the first above the first rib and uh, the subclavian muscle hypertrophy or clavicle fracture can cause compression the primary costal clavicle without any etiology if it is there it's called so called as paget schroter syndrome and quadrangular space is more of neurological tears where it can be teres major teres minor surgical neck of humerus and triceps long head will be there and it can compress on the cords of the brachial plexus and cause neurological symptoms so it's based arterial compression if it is there it is based on the sure staging stage 0 is asymptomatic no treatment if the patient is having minor posterior dilatation decompression aneurysmal damage patient or the patient is having intimal damage resection and reconstruction and if there is going to embolize then you should do embolectomy also one last thing just we have said so much about dibeki dentin coli sarah also said 
just from my side they are very fond of they have asked you multiple times in the exam dibeki dendan kuli and oscar creech were the cardiac surgeon were associated with baylor college and uh, they described aortic dissection management and dibeki himself developed aortic dissection and died at the age of 97 in 2005 he uh, in he was i was diagnosed in 2005 and uh, he underwent the surgery in 2006 it's not like 97 age and it is underwent the surgery in 2006 and uh, that brings to the end of uh, presentation from my side i believe if there is any questions i think i'm happy to answer it um, i think we are always there for you and uh, if uh, there is any doubts please do reach us and we'll be happy to clarify any doubts is there anything else you want to add sir yeah very definitely sir and uh, we will also uh, very very happy to help you uh, regarding the interview if you people got selected in ini nims or uh, citra so kindly uh, inform dr dorial so you will be uh, organizing a mock interview session uh, before your interview it will be very helpful before attending the interview sir so many a times what happens is they will be uh, the consultants uh, as consultants will be uh, will be uh, will be more, most happy to help you out so that you can answer the simple questions that you can cover the questions so when you go to the interview you will not feel any stress at all i think it is very important for you to you know reach us out so that if you could say say to us that you have got selected so that we can conduct a mock interview if you can if you attend the mock interview it will be very very easy for you to sit inside the exam hall and take the inter final interview and uh, you should go We, uh, you should pass out with flying colors and that's what we want also i hope you make use of the opportunity and uh, use the facility and dr tutorial sahab will also also has all the uh, materials there and they are also bringing out the hard copies i think mean, you should make use of them as well oh definitely that was a great discussion uh, murli sir very useful for this for thank you sir okay yes, i sir. believe if there is any doubts please reach uh, reach uh, call us messages personally messages we are more than happy to answer any queries and if we have not answered in any of the forums please do personally message we are happy to discuss them as well definitely oh definitely till then all the very best guys okay sir see you sir okay all the best guys thank you thank you